I like that shirt. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's a cool shirt. You're, you're getting just cooler every time I see you, JP. Uh, we got, how y'all doing? Was that good? You're doing good. Okay, when I count to three, you tell me in a sentence how you're doing. One, two, three. Oh, mercy me. Mercy me. Uh, going to be hot, huh? It's going to be hot. My poor body doesn't know what to do because I'm, I'm on a six-week sabbatical book writing thing, and I'm going to the coast, and then I come here, and then I go up north, and I, I, I'm down to 70 degrees, and 118 degrees, and then 60 degrees, and that's crazy that you're all doing good. I had some jokes tonight, but you don't want any jokes. You just want to get into the Word, right? You just want you straight in the Word, right? Okay, just, just one. I got this a while back. I thought this was so funny. It says called black and white TV. After being married for 50 years, I took a careful look at my wife one day and I said, 50 years ago, we had a cheap house, a junk car. I slept on the sofa and I watched a 10 inch black and white TV, but I got to sleep every night with an 18 year old, hot 18 year old. Now we have a $500,000 home, a $35,000 car, a nice big, big bed and a large screen TV, but I'm sleeping with a 60-year-old woman. It seems to me you're not holding up your side of the bargain. My wife's a very reasonable woman. She's told me she should go out and find a hot 18-year-old and I'll make sure that you're once again living in a cheap house, driving a junk car, <laughs> sleeping on a sofa, watching a 10-inch TV. I thought that was pretty funny. I thought that was funny. But you know what? I'm, I've come here tonight to start a conversation with you. And I want to start this conversation and I'm going to keep the conversation going on Sunday. Take it a little different angle though. I'll take it a different direction. But I'm going to give you, a lot of you, I don't know if you're on my Twitter or not, but I, I tweet stuff every day. And I want to give you something that I tweeted today. I put, if the secret sorrows of everyone could be read on their forehead, how many who now cause envy would suddenly become the object, object of our pity? And, and I really thought about that when I put that on. And I don't know what that is, but I'm not feeling it, so I'm okay. <laughs> but when you look at people sometimes, you see they have all this stuff. You begin to wonder in some situations, what did they pay to get all that stuff? Some people, it came natural, others it didn't. I was in Vegas last time I was here, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with this, I mean, but I saw a 68-year-old guy walking down with a 25-year-old gal, and they looked like they were arguing or whatever, and I just thought for a moment, I thought, you know, I doubt that's his first wife, and I wonder what he gave up. I wonder what's been laid waste to get to that place where he's at, and so... That was one of my posts, and two more I, I posted last week, and these might be ramas for you, but it says, a nail will come out, but its hole remains. Mm. Some of us need to be a little less handy with the hammer. Some of us think we can do whatever we want to do, and we take the nail out, but it says the hole remains. And another word for somebody here tonight is a dog that intends to bite doesn't always show its teeth. Better think about it. See, I believe when we come out here and, and whatever's on our heart, you know, to ch share, like even a, a tweet, that could change someone's life. I believe if someone here tonight could have already heard God in one of those tweets. And you go, I'm ready to go home. I, I just heard God. See, you know, you got to think about the Bible. You know, when, boy, I don't know what that is. Is that, is that me? What is it? You don't think it's screwed in good enough. It, that's what I need to do? Yeah, it's tight. Uh... As long as it's not hurting, I'm okay. Once I start hurting, uh, but I believe with all of my heart that anything that's said could be God's word to you. And so what we're going to do right now, we're going to pray and we're going to release God's spirit. Now when we, rele when we release God's spirit, it's even possible for you to hear things when I take a breath. I don't know how many times in the past I've had someone come up and say, you blew me away tonight when you said this, 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 this. And I go, I didn't say that, 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 that. I didn't even say that. You heard that. I didn't say that. And so we're going to release God right now. You want to do that? And we're going to hear God. Now, right now, you have to choose to believe you're going to hear God. You will see what you're looking for. Right now. You got to do me a favor. 
lay aside every burden you have, lay aside everything and just, just want to hear God. Don't think about what you're going to do afterwards tonight. Don't think about what you did before you came. Everybody pray with me and say, Lord God, right now, I give you my mind. I give you my heart. Speak to me. And I believe you will. In Jesus' name, amen. John 12, 1 and 3. Let's take a look at it. John 12, 1 and 3. Jesus, therefore... Six days before the Passover came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And they made him a supper there. And Martha was serving. Now hold it, wait a second. Now let's, let's keep this verse up. Say, Martha's serving. Wait, wait. Didn't she learn the lesson of a few chapters earlier? I mean, come on. Is she as hard-headed as some of us? Didn't Jesus just blast her a few chapters earlier about serving? And Mary's found the best part. Isn't that true? Well, you know what? I think she's okay here. I'll tell you why. See, I don't think Martha was blasted for serving. She was blasted for serving and griping about it. That's why she was blasted by Jesus. He said, hey, if you're going to gripe about it, I'll just tell you, Mary's chosen the best part. But so anyway, somebody has to serve. And so she's serving, but Lazarus is one of those reclining at the table with him. So the next verse, many then... Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume, a pure nard, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Mary, she takes this perfume, you say costly perfume. This little jar of perfume was probably worth in today's day and age thousands of dollars. And most of the people in Israel during this time era, they, most of the people that are, had any substance, economic substance to them at all, they had perfume. And it was for anointing the dead. They would anoint their dead relatives, their dead family, and that's what it was for. Now Mary had probably already used half of this on Lazarus. And she's just not using the other half for Jesus. Now the guys here, all of the guys had no clue what she was doing. They got irritated. What's she doing using this costly perfume and pouring on the feet of you? We don't get it. See, but Jesus said in the text, he gave us a little clue. He said, she's anointing me for my death. Duh. None of the guys got it. They didn't realize that Jesus was, was on the verge of dying. They didn't get it. Mary got something that the other guys didn't get. Why didn't the guys get it and why did Mary get it? Because Mary had been sitting at the feet of Jesus. The guys had been running around doing all kinds of stuff. But she was always at the feet of Jesus. And she was learning. And she had spiritual eyes. And she knew he was going to die. And so she takes his perfume and she anoints him. Now here's the part I want you to see. And this is going to be a foundation that we're going to spring from today and Sunday. What would it have been like to actually touch God's son in the flesh. I mean, I, this blows me away. It blows me away that I could have even been in the room with God in the flesh, his son. But to touch him and to, to pour perfume on him and to wipe his feet and massage his back or whatever she did, I mean, that just blows me away. And as I was reading this some weeks or a couple months ago, it hit me that because she loved Jesus, she found a special place in the kingdom. Mary was, was really loved by Jesus back because she loved him. And I started thinking about, whoa, I wish I could have done that. I wish I could have massaged his shoulders and been there with him. And then I stopped and thought about it. We can. We can love the person of Jesus just like Mary did. Really, we can. Look at John 14, 15. We're going to find a way that we can love Jesus just like Mary loved him. It says, if you love me and you want to love on me and you want to massage me and make me feel good, then keep my commandments. That makes me feel like, that's my love language, he says. Keep my commandments. Now, let me say a word about grace real quick because that's a hot topic today. But we're saved by grace. And we're kept saved by grace. But that has nothing to do with us 
serving God and pleasing God. For example, let, let's kind of change this around. In fact, it makes me suspicious. A lot of guys are out there today, and this is a big thing in the church. We're saved by grace, saved by grace. Oh, I don't, we're not saved by works. You know, some people are preaching, you're saved by works. And I'm going, why are you making a big deal out of it? Why? Why is this such a big deal? You're so adamantly against doing stuff for God? And it makes you mad when anybody get, even gets on the fringes of saying, you know, we have to work for God. When I hear these teachings, there's a lot of young pastors doing this today. They're not teaching the whole word of God. I'd love to have a debate with them, an open debate. I could throw 40, 50, 60 verses of them. You'll be judged for your deeds. And it goes on and on. Hebrews 12 says, you know what? He said, you better get your life right, man. Because it says, you know, your knee's about to, 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 to be knocked out of joint. You, you need to get these things fixed. In 1 Corinthians 11, it says, judge yourself, judge, judge the way you're living. If you're living, you know, blasphemous before the Lord, if you're living in such a way that you're not appreciating what he did on Calvary, he said, you can get sick and you can even die. Just, you know, it, stuff could happen. He says, man, if you judge yourself, then you would not be judged by God, Paul said. Now, we need to work for God, but, but it has nothing to do with invalidating grace. Do you understand this? Let me give it to you this way. Let's say I'm a thug. And I'm out there living on the streets and one day this filthy, rich, good man that lives in the community comes to me or he sends a servant to me and he says, the master wants to adopt you and bring you into his family. Me? But I'm a filthy thug. I rob and I steal and I get drunk. All Why would he want me? I don't know. He just loves you and he's seen you and his heart went out to you and he wants to adopt you. Well, if he adopts me, that's being saved by grace. See, that has nothing to do with me. It's just a favor. Wow. But when I get into the family and I see the family business running, I'm not going to want to sit back and continue to do drugs and continue to drink and continue to be a thug. I'm going to want to get with the family business, am I not? And do you think the father might kind of expect me to get with it? He might say, you know, you're kind of disrespecting me. You know, I, I brought you in and I thought you just as a favor to me, you'd kind of want to start serving and helping out. Is that not true? And out of a heart appreciation, we should want to work with God. We should want to be a part. We should want to obey his commandments. That's just normal. Uh, my son and I right now, Josh, he's, he's my son. And see, Josh, would, he'll, he'll be my son forever. No matter what he does, he's my son. No matter what he doesn't do, he's my son. And he'll always be my son. There's no way you can change that. If Josh just decided he didn't even want to call me dad anymore, he's still my son. But we went into business together. We're in some business together, right? He's working for the church. I'm working with him. And because we're in business together, that means I have to call him three times a week. I have to talk to him. I have to go have breakfast with him. I have to make sure that he's doing good because he's representing me out there. And in the same way, I'm telling you, when we start obeying God and getting involved in the kingdom, not only are we his son or daughter, but he begins to talk to us. And our needs begin to be his needs because we're representing the company now. And all of a sudden we get intimacy and it just gets crazy good. So the Bible says, Jesus says, if you want to love me the way Mary loved me, if you really want to love me, you want to know my love language, you want to really want to know it? Obey my commandments. That's my love language. And so what we did at the church, we said, well, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go back to Romans. We're in Romans anyway. And we're going to look at some of his commandments. It was given to Paul. And we're going to look at them. That's what we're going to do tonight. So let's look at Romans 12 and 12. Let's look at some of the commandments that, that God has given us through the apostle Paul. And this is love language. Romans 12 and 2. Let's look at that. There's three things here. And now I'm going to skip the devoted to prayer because I'm coming back the end of July and I'll cover this one maybe. But right now I'm going to talk about rejoicing in hope. And persevering in tribulation. When you do those two things, you're speaking God's love language. Okay? Now, the first one is rejoice in hope. I told you some months back when I came here that there's a difference between hope and faith. And you have to understand this stuff. For example, the Bible says that faith is a substance. And I've told you before. Faith has weight to it. Faith is something real. It's weighty. Now, faith comes to you when God speaks a personal word to you. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by a word from God, a rhema from God. And so when God speaks to you and confirms it, faith comes into your life concerning that object he's talking to you about. And it's weighty and it's a substance. 
For example, I'm doing something different now. I'm, I'm discipling pastors throughout the country. And I had several of them at our church on Sunday from Dallas, Texas, and Ohio. And I went over to the coast to spend some time with these pastors, and they were great men. I mean, they all reminded me of your pastor, Jim. These are, these are great men. And I went over, and, and we sat, and we were talking and praying. We, we went out into the sand dunes and got some sand buggies. Man, we rented them, went over the sand. I just played with them, ministered to them, loved on them, went and ate with them. But as we sat there that night in the house, we started conversing. I said, tell me about, I want to hear from each one of you. Tell me, because I just met him that day. Tell me about your ministry. Tell me where you're going. Well, Pastor Ron, this is what I'm doing, and this is what I'm doing. But every one of them had one thing in common. We're afraid of failure. And Pastor Ron, right now, we're really afraid that we're not going to make it. We have bills, two and three million. We have this, we have that. And I looked at him, all these pastors, and I said, let me ask you all a question. Has God told any of you that you are where he wants you to be and confirmed it. Do you know that you're where he's, he wants you to be? And they all said, no, we don't. I said, well, and I took a TV coaster and I did what I did with you right now. I said, do you understand that when God speaks, the substance of faith is formed and it comes into your heart and that motivates you and that keeps you going when things are going bad. I want every one of you guys to go home. And I want you to get on your knees and ask God, am I where you want me? Have you told me to do this? Am I in the right place? And you stay on your knees till you hear him and he confirms it. Once he does, then hell and high water will not stop you from doing what he's called you to do because you know he's called you there. That's the reason that I've been with Valley now going on 40 years. In two years, it'll be 40 years. My resume's real simple. God called me to pioneer that church, and we pioneered this one. He called me, never told me different. I can't leave unless he divinely speaks to me and confirms it. And I begged him. I even pulled verses out of the Bible. A prophet's without honor in his own country. Can I leave? Because I was born in Bakersfield. I said, you know, I I can't stay here. He won't let me go. And because he divinely called me, he's going to have to divinely call me away or I have to stay. Now, let me tell you again how faith is formed, and I'm going to talk to you about hope. When we were in a shoe store building years ago, we were praying for a new building because we outgrew the shoe store building. And so we were praying that God would talk to us and show us where we were supposed to go next. And one day, uh, somebody called me up and they said, Pastor Ron, did you know there's an old church building called Calvary Bible over here and it's going to come up for sale? You ought to think about getting it. So that went in my ears and I thought, oh, that's interesting. But no faith yet. That isn't, that isn't a miracle if someone says that. But then, you wouldn't believe what started happening. I came to church, walking down the aisle one day, and a, a visitor that, that, that didn't know anything about anything pulled me aside and, Pastor Ron, there's a building coming up for sale over here. It's called Calvary Bible, and I think you ought to get it. Then one of my leader's wives called me, knew nothing about these other things. She says, I was praying today, and God said he wants us to have that Calvary Bible building. Then we had a guest speaker come one day, and he says, you know, when I come out again, I'll even sleep in your basement. And that building had a basement. And so it just started coming like this. And then I went to prayer about it. And when I prayed, it got stronger and stronger. So finally, I came to the conclusion, God is saying he wants us to have that building. Now, at that point, after three or four or five miraculous things happen, I have faith. Now I'm not going to be stopped. So one day, I took our congregation after church. We were in walking distance. The shoe store was from Calvary Bible Building. And we walked down, laid our hands on it. When those people were getting out of church, and we said, this is our building. You told us we're going to have it. Da, 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 da. And we got the building. We got it. Same thing we did here. Identical, right? I do that. I lay hands on stuff. You all know about this building. We laid hands on this building, too, uh, six years before Pastor Jim got it. And we cursed it to be used by anybody else. And, it, 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 and, and you know, it wasn't rented for five, six years. This thing sat here, that Just for Feet building, sat here empty. They couldn't rent it to anybody because we got out and cursed it like Jesus did the fig tree. We said, you will not have any fruit. You will not have any fruit in that building until you give it to us. That is our building. And uh, you say, you're so radical. Yes. I'm telling you again today, and I've said it before. I believe with all of my heart that my life is to be just like Elijah, Abraham, Elisha, Daniel. You say, wait, 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 those were Old Testament patriarchs. No, no, no. they were the only people in the Old Testament with a visitation of the Holy Spirit. That's why they stood out. It's exactly why they stood out. And I don't think my life should be any different than that. See, a lot of us, we couldn't hang with the people in the Bible if they came back to life today. I mean, how would you like to go to Starbucks with John the Baptist? He might have some grasshoppers and honey sticking on his beard and 
He might come in and jump on a table and start preaching to people. That would embarrass the daylights out of you. And some of the other prophets that laid naked out in the street, they did radical things. I'm not going to go there, but that's pretty radical. And so, that's the way faith comes. Faith, when you have faith, when God speaks to you about someone, confirms it two or three times, and you have faith as a result, you can't be stopped. Faith, I always described it as that I know, 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 that I know. Like when God told me I would not die of leukemia, and he confirmed it with miracles, miracles. Hey, I I couldn't die of leukemia. I just couldn't. Because God said it, I had faith, and I, I just couldn't be stopped, and I was praising God for it. Now, listen to me. Old Testament Israel, they used to never go to war until they got a rhema from God. And then once they got a rhema from God, they could not be stopped. They'd get the priest to come in with the ephod and the Urim and Thummim. We don't know what it was. We know the priest had an ephod and he had two uh, substances in there, kind of like stones called the Urim and Thummim. And when they would ask God questions, it would glow some way to give an answer. It was supernatural. It's the identical symbolism of the Holy Spirit in us today. It glows. Remember the two guys on the road to Emmaus? They said when Jesus was talking to us, didn't our hearts burn within us? You say, are you Mormon? No, the Mormons stole that from us. That came out of the Bible. And so... What they would do is they would say, we're not going to war until we get the priest in here and we're going to seek God. God, should we go? And they'd wait till they heard, yes, and you will have a great victory. It might have been like those old games they used to have. And it probably spelled out letters. I don't even know. But once they heard from God that go and you'll have a great victory, man, those guys couldn't be stopped. See, I'm going to tell you right now, you have to win your battles in prayer. Valley Campus Bakersfield, we started something, and I cannot wait to see what happens. We started something, and this is not a fad. As You can mark me right now in here that as long as I'm senior pastor of that campus, we will never, ever stop doing what we started five weeks ago. As a staff, we pray together over eight hours a week. Hours as a staff. Now, the day we was up at the ranch, we were up at the ranch, and we prayed, me and my staff prayed for three hours, and we couldn't believe where the time went. We got through, we go, it was three hours. Here's what God showed us. He showed us that there's a demonic, and I've told Pastor Jim this too, there's a demonic blanket over the church. There's some ruler demons over that church, and I believe here too. And God showed me some months ago, he said, you will not grow anymore until you pray through that barrier. And you knock those demons and you will not grow. Don't look to grow numerically. Don't, don't look to add any more services till you pray through that barrier. And every day we go in there and, and I'm kind of radical. I say, in Jesus' name right now, demons, I want to tell you something. We're coming through. And there isn't anything you're going to do to stop us. In the name of Jesus, I curse every one of you. I cur- you better get out of the way because we're praying through. We're not going to stop. Same place, same time, every day. It's crazy. And then we start quoting the word to one another. I'll go, Pastor Brad. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, saith the Lord. He'll look back at me and go, Pastor Ron, you can do all things, Pastor Ron, through the God who strengthens you. And we start quoting over one another. I'm telling you, it's, I don't know what's going to happen, but I told these guys, it might be two months, three months, six months, or nine months, but once we break through that barrier, all heaven's going to rain down on us. And I'll tell you what, I don't know what's going to happen, but we are going to build our church from now on by prayer, and nothing, prayer is going to be the driving force that's going to build us. And I challenge you to watch. You can watch. I mean, it seems like we got to a place of so many people and we're kind of staying there, but we're going to break through it. Now, you pray through strained relationships and divorce situations. No matter what you're going through tonight, you need to come to the altar and pray and say, God, I'm not leaving until I hear something from you. And if I don't hear it today, I'll come back tomorrow. If I don't hear it then, I'll come back back until I hear something. Once you hear something, you've got to get it confirmed two times, once or twice. Every fact's confirmed by two or three witnesses. Once you know something's God, whoa, whoa, whoa. Now, example, faith changes the way you live. Now, see, if I have a bad marriage, the first thing I have to do is go to the altar and go, God, got a bad marriage. He says she wants a divorce. I'm not sure if I should allow the divorce, if I should fight for my marriage. I got to hear from you. So I might have to pray for a week or 10 days. I keep praying until I hear God. Now, if God says... Thus saith the Lord, you're to fight for this marriage. And then he confirms it three times out there, miraculously. You know, somebody else calls me up, I was praying today at two o'clock, and you're supposed to fight for your marriage. You go, that's the time I was praying, two o'clock, asking God for, woo! And then I go to church that week, and the pastor preaches on 
sustaining your marriage and, and, and fighting for your marriage. And then, then I go home and devotions. And I mean, three or four, I go, whoa, this is God. Now, once I have faith that God says, I'm going to save your marriage. Is that going to make a difference in the way I treat my spouse than if I didn't have faith? Yeah, now I'm going to go in and I will say, baby, you know what? You have a boyfriend? If you do, I will curse that relationship and I'll kill it. I, it, won't, it won't succeed. And you know what, babe? I'm praying for you every day that God will plant a seed of love back in your heart for me. And it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And I mean, but then on the other hand, if I go to prayer and I don't hear anything from God, or I do hear something, God, he says, let it go, let it go. Then I don't do anything. I just let it dissolve. I say, hey, when are you leaving? I'll help you pack your bags. God hasn't told me to fight for this marriage. And so that's faith. That's faith. Now, you say, okay, faith motivates. It inspires. But faith is different than hope. Now, in, in, in three years, we have to have $8 million from somewhere. And, and if you see our congregation, we're not a rich congregation. But God's spoken to me. And I know that I know. They're going to they're fold, they'll fold on our building. The bank will fold on us. But you know what? God has spoken to us in prayer. If they came to get our building, I would just laugh. I'd say, try. God says you can't have it. <laughs> and, and, and I wouldn't even try if I were you. I mean, it gives you that kind of confidence. The Bible almost describes, it has a word that describes uh, the way we're supposed to live. And one of the Greek words says this, we're to live recklessly as if the carpet can no way be drawn out from underneath us. That's the way we're to live. Once you hear God and know that he's in charge, that's the way you live. Now, listen to me closely. Look at James 1, 2, and 5. Just to sustain what I'm already telling you. Consider it all joy, my brethren. Now, oh, this is crazy. When I come back and preach on prayer, we're going to talk about Paul's thorn in the flesh. It's crazy. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But, say with me, but. Here's the clincher. Now, now this is what it says here. It says, if you're going through a trial, start rejoicing, get happy. You say, but I, I don't understand why I should. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it'll be given to him. So you say, God, give me a clue as to what we're doing here. Ask for wisdom in your trial. What should I be doing? How do I hear you? And then you'll be able to correspond correctly. So this is faith. Where do you get faith at? Church is a good place to get faith. Like tonight, I, something might come through my lips that confirms something that God's already said to you three times. You go, woo! That's it. That's it. That was the, that was the third time I needed to hear it. Uh, you get faith in fellowship and in prayer and in reading the word. Now, faith and hope is different. Now, I'm going to take this real quickly. Hope is the way you approach the truths in the Bible. For example, the Bible says, when we die, we're going to heaven. Now, God has never spoken a rhema to me and says, Ron Vietti, when you die, you shall go to heaven. If that was the case, I'd get faith, you know. But he doesn't need to. He said in his word. So, faith is different than hope in the fact that hope is based on the written word of God more. For example, the Bible promises us eternal life. Do I believe that? Oh, yes, I do. But has God ever spoken that personally to me? No, he hasn't. But I know it's true. Guys, what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to skip Titus, 1 Peter, and 1 Timothy. I'll skip those three sets of verses. All those verses are going to do, because I'm running out of time here, is they're going to prove that the apostles had the hope of heaven, the hope of eternal life. So God doesn't have to speak things to me that are already in his written word. I just believe in those because they're in the written word. I have hope in everything that's written in that word, whether he speaks them to me or not. Again, my cancer leukemia. It went from hope to faith. When I had leukemia, first of all, as soon as I found out I had four years to live, I went to God and I prayed a lot and I had hope. Hope in the word of God. What's my hope? That God would never leave me nor forsake me. That was my hope. My hope was that, you know what? He would see me through it no matter what the end result was. I had hope and I believed in that. If somebody asked me, what's gonna happen? I don't know, but my God will be there for me and you can take that to the bank. But then he took it from hope to faith. Then he spoke to Ron Vietti, you will not die of this. You're going to live through it. Now, he did that, confirmed it four times in miraculous signs. Now I got faith. So now it's not just generic. It's, you know what? Now I have faith that I'm going to live through it. Are you understanding? Do I have to go any further than this? You, you got what, the difference between hope and faith. They're both really, really strong. Let's look at the next thing. If you want to please God, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to rejoice in hope. 
God gets happy when you, when you say, the Bible says it, and I believe it, and that's good enough for me. He, that, that's his love language. The next thing is persevere in tribulation and trials. If you want to make God happy, his love language, that's it. Now listen to me. Everybody here tonight has problems and has issues. Nobody here doesn't have. But in spite of our problems and issues, God wants us to continue to go forward. There's a parable of the unrighteous steward in the Bible, and basically I'll just sum this parable up for you. There was this guy who was a liar, a conniver, and a cheater. And this guy one day got caught by his boss cheating, lying, and conniving. And he said, you know what? I'm gonna fire you. You're a liar, conniver, cheater. So I'll tell you what, I'll give you two weeks to get everything straightened up and you gotta get a new job. Well, when this guy heard that his boss was firing him, what did he do? Did he repent? Did he ask for forgiveness? No, he just lied and cheated and connived even more. He just said, okay, I'm gonna call everybody in and say, you owe my master 50 uh, stocks of, of, uh, of, of whatever wheat or barrels of wheat or whatever, cut it to 20 and, and you know, I'll make a deal with you. So this liar, conniver, cheater, when he got caught, and his boss says, fix the books up because you've got to find a new job. He just lied, connived, and cheated all the more. And that parable is kind of confusing because when they were writing it, they said that Jesus says that he's more proud of that guy than anything. He's proud of this guy who's lying, conniving, and cheating. He says, you know, I like this guy. And he goes on to say, he says, because he's committed to a system. And he said, you know what? He is more committed to his system, he says, than most believers are to theirs. And he says, so I praise him. What it says about it says he praises the unrighteous steward. If you're looking for the real me, he praises him. And when you read it, you go, praise the unrighteous steward? He says, yeah. He said, because he never deviates from his system. He lies, connives, and cheats. And when he gets caught, he just lies and connives and cheats that much more. And he just keeps on doing it. He's committed, man. And he says, I'm, I praise him because the sons of light aren't that committed. When you run low on money, what are you to do? You're to keep on tithing. Don't stop. When your relationship goes bad, what do you do? You keep on loving until God tells you differently. You stick to your values, no matter what. You, but see, a lot of us change, change kingdoms. We run low on money, what do we do? We stop tithing and we start stealing. See, we, we switch kingdoms. And God said, no, no, I like people that stick to their guns, no matter what. Now. There's a rhema for some of you here tonight, and that is, you're too passive. You're too, there are times, there are times where God will say in a trial, stand still and watch the salvation of the God move for you. What? There's times. But there are other times, and some of you here, this isn't for everybody, some of you need to stand still and watch God move, but there are times where you're too passive. God has never called you to be a victim. I posted this on Facebook a while back. I wrote, don't give up. I may not be there yet, but I'm closer than I was yesterday. Quitters never win, and winners never quit. Another thing I posted a week or so earlier was something that's been around for a long time. It's called Run to the Roar. Lions. You know lions, they sometimes socially are, are more humane and nice than we are as humans. Lions, people that have studied them have, have realized for ages that lions, when, when they have a pride of lions and they have a king of the pride. When he gets older and his teeth starts falling out and arthritis and rheumatism sets in, they're still pretty cool with that guy. The young lions come up, they whip him, so now they have a new king. The young guys are coming up and they're taking over. And I was told this story, oh, decades ago, and I've since then researched it and I think it's true. They said that these lions, they still make a place for this old king who's now retired. And his teeth's all out. And he's got arthritis and rheumatism. And they said, what'll happen very often when they go hunting for deer, what'll happen is the lions will surround the meadow and all the young lions, the powerful ones, the, the ones that with all the vigor and strength will get at one end of the meadow and wait. They'll send the old guy around to the other side. Now he just barely gets around there. He gets around there and teeth's all missing. And they say, give it one good roar. So he gets at the other end of the meadow and he has one good roar in him. And he'll, okay, Hurrah! when he does, what does a deer do? Runs the opposite way into the mouths of the hungry young lions. And they get killed. Now, if the deer only knew what some of you need to know, if the deer would run towards the roar, they would have been fine. Because that old boy has no teeth. 
He can't run because he's got arthritis, rheumatism, nothing. And that word for some of you tonight, and it was a word for some people on Facebook, sometimes there's times where you need to run toward the roar in Jesus' name. Go toward it. And say, you know what? You've been intimidating me long enough. You know what, sweetheart? Quit saying you're going to leave, you're going to leave. You either leave or let's get it together and go to the altar. Sometimes you have to confront. Do you hear what I'm saying? Again, this is moving the spirit. Sometimes you don't, sometimes you do. If you're here tonight and this is a word for you, you'll say, that's for me. I've already heard it 10 times. I already know. So we have to persevere. See, I like to persevere. I like, to me, sometimes it just feels good to go forward at full momentum when it's the most illogical thing to do. But that's my personality we'll talk about Sunday. My very first rhema I had when I got leukemia, was given four years to live. Very first rhema I got was God says, you know what? He showed me a picture and he said, if you try to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose it for my sake, you'll find it, Ron Vietti. He gave me that rhema, and I don't have time to go through the story. It was miraculous the way he gave it to me. And he showed me a picture of going to Mexico and building houses and loving orphans. He said, just keep on doing that. Keep on persevering. Don't you back up. And he said, if you keep on doing my business, I'll take care of your business. Just keep on going. Keep on going forward. <laughs> Friday night three weeks ago, uh, the high school department was having a barn party up at the ranch. And every time they have one, I like to go hang out with them. I just love it. And so I've been to a couple. My wife has never been to one. So I said, do you want to go up and let's hang out at the barn party tonight with the high schoolers? And they always allow me to speak. You know, they say, hey, Pastor Ron, come and share your heart with all of everybody. They're up in the barn. They're, they're hanging over the, the lofts. And they're all, kids are all over the place, 125, 150. They're all over, high schoolers. And so when we got up there, we parked our car. And then pretty soon there were cars everywhere in the ranch. And Debbie looked at me and says, Ron, she said, uh, how are we going to get out to go home? We're, we're, we're blocked in. I said, oh, Debbie, don't worry about going home. We'll be the last one leaving tonight because once these kids get a hold of us, they're going to ring us, ring us dry. Now, now, here's the deal. Before I went up to the barn party, I had the worst pains. I've been having some real pains in my body lately. I was hurting so bad, I felt like going to bed. But you know what? I believe in persevering. I believe God called me to do it. So you know what I did? I popped a whole bunch of Advil, got in my car, went up there, and got her done. Got her done. That's a word for somebody here tonight. Sometimes. Now, I understand some of you are seriously ill, and you can't do that. But some of us, we let little aches and pains bother us too much. Get some Advil down, baby, and let's get her up and get her done. And I went up there, and boy, does it break your heart. As soon as I get through talking, these kids line up to talk to me. I mean, they're all over the place. First one comes up, big strapping kid. He's Pastor Ron. He says, I'm hurting. And his lips start going, I said, what's the matter? He says, "Uh, my dad beat me up the other day. He says, Pastor Ron, something's broke inside of me. He said, he hit me, bloodied me up. He said, something broke. I don't love him anymore. Where's your mom at? She left me when I was eight years old. I said, oh, man. Your daddy beat you up. My first thought was, I'll beat the snot out of that guy. Bring him here. I'll show him some stuff in Jesus' name. (laughs) That's the the flesh response, is it not? not? Come on, guys. Is that not the flesh response? It is. You don't beat your son up and bloody him up. And so I, I got it taken care of. Went to the next kid. He says, Pastor Ron, he was crying also. He says, could you, could you pray that my dad will find a job? He says, where do I need a job? And I said, okay, I'll do that. I said, uh, how are you, you got any food in the house? And he goes, no. I said, you got any food in the house? No. I said, man, get this kid some food. Then I go to this little girl, she just got saved. She knows nothing. She doesn't know anything about Christianity. And I said, you got saved tonight? So I got saved. And she says, I need you to pray for me, why? I said, well, I don't have a mom and dad neither. And said, my brother raised me, 18, gangster, and I watched him murdered last year. I watched him murdered. Pastor Ron, I have hatred in my heart. I prayed for her. I said, you have a Bible? I don't have a Bible. Gave her a Bible. And I could go on and on. Two boys up there, two different other boys. Their mamas left them when they were babies. They don't even know who their mamas are. You say, what's the point of all this? The point is, I persevered. I had to be there. 
I had to fight through some pains. And, some, and I could have justified, I'm not making a hero out of me. It wasn't a big thing, but I could have justified it. So can you. But sometimes you have to get her done anyway. And I believe we have to plow through. See, there's a lot of ministry needs in the church today that need to be, get, get done. And when we persevere, we don't feel good. We say, I'm coming down anyway. It's like you tonight. I give you kudos. You're all here. A lot of you had vacation Bible school. You're tired, but you persevered. You came down. You're here. These kids, too, I taught them how to walk with God. I look at these kids, and every year I do this, and I said, pornography. Some of you, a lot of them. Oh, you wouldn't believe. Junior hires that come up to me. I had another barn party. Junior hires crying, I want pornography, and I can't get off. I said, gang, pornography will take everything precious from you at some point in time. And I'm saying this for some adults here tonight. You will not beat the rap. If you're into pornography, you better come to the altar and get it right. At some point in time, it will take everything precious in your life. The devil doesn't play fair. He's going to take everything. He'll take your kids. He'll take your respect. He'll take your relationship with your wife. He'll let the demons get off you onto your children. He will take from you. Now, these kids, I tell them about God stories, and I love these kids. I mean, you know, again, I'm a shepherd, and I love them. One little girl, because I said, Pastor Ron, uh, uh, you know, I'll see you later. I- I'm staying up here. I'm house-sitting tonight up here on the hill. I said, wait, wait, Sarah, Sarah, wait, come back, wait. You're doing what? I'm house-sitting. By yourself? This is a spooky mountain. She said, yeah. I- oh, no, you're not. You wait around. My wife and I is going with you. We're going to look under the beds. We're going to go up there, and we're going to make sure you're okay. Don't you go anywhere, Sarah. See, that's the way real ministry comes when you just love these guys. I love them. I love them. So I made her wait. We went up a whole hill up here. She got out and opened a gate. And she goes in. There's a couple dogs there. And I said, man, are you sure you're going to be okay? Maybe Debbie and I should stay here with you. I'll be okay, Pastor Ron. I got a dog. I said, yeah, you got a dog. And that's a pretty mean dog. And he tried to kill me. And so anyway, I left her. And then she wrote me the next day. Pastor Ron, I had a God story. You, you have God stories? I have one. Every time I stay alone at night, I usually always turn on Christian music all night long, and it helps me sleep. And I didn't have any. But in the middle of the night, when I started getting scared, the dog started barking. I was real scared, and I was praying, God, help me. The dog knocked the TV clicker off the TV, touched it, turned the TV on to a Christian channel, and music played all night, Christian music. And I said, wow, that is so cool. Now, these kids are getting it. Now, you can have excuses for not getting involved in ministry. You know, I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm married. I'm not married. I have kids. I don't have kids. Can't work in there. Blah, 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 blah. That's, that's speaking in tongues. And the translation is it doesn't float. Okay? If we just start living by the word and doing what it says, we're going to be blessed. The word is God's truth. And if, and if, you, if you live by it, it'll set you free. And persevering through trials is what God's cause to do. It's his love language. Now, I have so much more to say, but the time says I only have five more minutes. So what do I want to say to you before I leave? Uh, persevere through the truth. Let's look at the next. Look at verse 14. I'm going to give you another one. Then we're going to go home. We'll look at a couple more verses, and we're going to be through in five minutes. Look at verse. Can you jump down to Romans 12 and 14, guys? Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. You say, Ron, I hate that verse. I do too. I wish there wasn't in there. I don't like that verse. Because I don't like to bless people that persecute me. But if you want to please God, and you want to minister to Him in His love language, bless those who persecute you. Now here's the deal. Listen to me closely. Why would God put that verse in the Bible? Because there are people out there that are real mean. And they hate Christians. But God still loves them. And so God's looking for a choice few people, a few people in the kingdom that would be audacious enough and love God enough to obey his word. And when these mean people come up and they persecute you and they knock Christianity and make fun of it, God wants a few good people to turn around and love them. Because these people, because they're mean and they hate Christians, and God still loves them, they're never going to experience the love of God until someone takes it on the chin and turns around and loves them. That's the only way they'll ever experience the love of God. And God knows that. So he's saying, if you really want to minister to me in my love language, he says then, 
bless those who persecute you. See, I know this. I was thinking back to the day I told Debbie. I was one of the Christian persecutors. Before I got saved, I hated you all. I hated Christians. I always told everybody, Christians are weak-willed, minded people. And they have to have a heaven to make them feel good because they can't face life. And those pastors, I hate them because all they want is your 10%, your 10%. I don't want anything to do with those guys neither. And one day, my wife was over to pastor's house getting some counsel and I drove up on my motorcycle and I got out and I cussed him out. I cussed him out. I told him, I said, don't you blame, don't you ever, da, da, my wife, don't you. And you know what he did? He slammed the door, so I'm calling the police, get out of here. Now, I, I thought back over that situation the other day. And I thought, what if he would have come out and said, son, 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 what's hurting you? What if he would have tried to love me? I think I was right fruit. I think I would have probably responded because I was looking for answers. I had anger in me. If he would have only done, if he only would have loved God with his love language, it would have saved me and my wife a lot of heartaches. Let me ask a question. Who's done you wrong? Can you think of someone's done you wrong? Think of somebody's done you wrong. Once you think of them, I anoint you for ministry to that person right now. I anoint you for ministry to that person. Listen to me. I remember one day, I was a Christian. And I knew this verse was in the Bible, but I didn't want to do it. I was coaching JBA, Little League, in Bakersfield, Little League, and my son was playing. And we were in the championship game. And we had a good team. And I went out early that day, and there was a coach on the other side. He had a long ponytail, real rough-looking guy. And he was cussing at his kids. He was cussing at them. He was all over them. And I thought, right away, I don't like that guy. I don't like him. I, I, I wish he would do so. I, I don't like him. To treat kids that way is horrible. Well, the game went on. And in the middle of the game, there was a call that I didn't like. So I walked out to the pitcher's mound. And I was talking to the umpire. I said, why would you call that that way? And so here he comes running out of his dugout. And he goes, hey, what are you talking about? I said, pardon me? I want to know what you're talking about. I said, hey, big shot, I don't think I was talking to you. You got ears, you hear? I wasn't talking to you. He said, you just answered me that way? I said, you bet your bottom dollar I did. He said, I'm going to beat you up after the game. I'm going to beat you up in front of all these people. And he went back to the side. And he said, furthermore, I'll beat your assistant coach up the same time. So I went back and I told my assistant coach, I said, we're both getting beat up after the game. <laughs> he looked at me and said, Ron, how dare him? How does he know that we haven't just freshly come out of prison? I said, no, no, no. look at him. He's the one that freshly came out of prison. We're not. <laughs> now, two innings later, a kid got hurt. And it was one of his kids, but it was close to where I was at on third baseline, so I ran out and he came out. And it took everything within me. I looked at him and I said, sir, I want to ask your forgiveness for what I said earlier. I'm a Christian. I'm not only a Christian, I'm a pastor. I had no right to say that to you. Now I want to tell you something, guys. One of the hardest things I ever did, because you men know what I'm talking about. I don't want to, be, I don't want to cower down to anybody. And that looked like I was just trying to get out of a fight. And I don't mind that. I, I'd rather fight him than, than, you know, part of me would. That was hard. Do you men know what I'm talking about? I was struggling with that, going, I, I'm not going to mouse out, because I'm the kind of guy, I mean, if you're going to fight, kill me, but I'm not backing down. That's my, that's my flesh nature, right? But when it comes to being who God wants you to be, sometimes you have no say-so about it. And I felt like a cow, I felt like a wimp, but he looked at me and said, you're on. He shook, his, shook my hand. I guess God really anointed it. But you, some of you men don't know what I'm talking about, some of you do. Let me just end with this right here. How do we practically do this? How do we love those who persecute us? There's practical ways to do it. If you've got somebody at work that persecutes you, persecutes you, persecutes you, one day you might think, I think I'm going to buy donuts for everybody say at work. And you come in and you say, Johnny, the guy's persecuting you. You say, Johnny, I got some donuts today and I remember you saying something a couple months ago that you liked maple sticks and I, I got you three. He goes, what? That's the way you do it. You're the person that persecutes you and hates you, they, they drop something and you're the first one over there helping to pick it up. You're helping to pick it up. Look at verse 20 and we're ending. Verse 20. But if your enemy's hungry, feed him, and if he's thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. What does that mean? I could tell you the Greek thought here, and there's a really a good thought line to this, but I'll summarize it this way. When you love those who persecute you, when you love those who hate you, you mess with their head. 
That's what it means. You mess with her head. The burning coals on their head is the heat, you know. You mess with her head. And they go, why did he just love me? I treated him bad. Why did she just love me? I treated her bad. Why, why, why? You mess with their head. Because the Bible says the kindness of God leads to repentance. Repentance means a change of mind. And when people go, wait, your God loves me in spite of what I'm doing, they're going to have a change of mind about your God. I got more to say. We can continue this conversation Sunday. Time says we're up, and I don't want Jim to beat me up for going over time, okay? So I, I'm out on time. Let's pray this right here. Father God, I thank you that you have a love language. And God, you probably only feel loved when we love you in your love language. And you've given us all kinds of things in the Bible. You say, this is what I want you to do. Now, you don't have to do these to be saved. You can still be my kid and not do them. But when you do them, you're speaking my love language. And I will feel loved. And when I feel loved, you're going to feel blessed. If you're here tonight, say, Pastor Ron, I'm not right with God. And, and man, I, I'm getting, you know, I'm kind of excited about coming to these Bible studies and learning and stuff. But I got to get right with God first. Something you said tonight made me think I need to get right with God. We just lift your hand and I, I, won't, I won't make you get up. I won't make you do anything. But raise your hand and say, you know, I'm not right with God and I want to get right with God, Pastor. Just lift your hand up and say, I'm not ashamed of it. God bless you. Bless you. Yeah, God bless you. Anybody join these two or three, four? Anybody else join these? Because God sees the hand. He sees it. God bless you, sweetheart. Yeah, and you, buddy, back here. And sir, sir. Yes, over here. Okay, now God sees the hand. Now you're going to have to believe in this prayer. You that raise your hands and everybody else believe in this prayer and everybody pray with me and say, Lord God, tonight, forgive me for my sins. Send the Holy Spirit. Come into my body right now and start living in me. I give you my life. I give you permission. Come on, say it with me, gang. I give you permission to mess with my life because my life is yours tonight and I know I can never take it back because I'm making a deal with you tonight and I'm giving you my life I'm now a Christian say it with me again everybody I'm now a Christian I'm now a child of God I'm in right standing with God he will hear my prayers thank you for receiving me in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I'll see you Sunday. God bless. Thank you for listening. We pray that this message has ministered to your heart. If you don't already have a church you call home, we invite you to join us at Valley Bible Fellowship here in Las Vegas for fellowship, Bible study, worship, and more. We are located at 4500 West Sahara Ave, near Sahara and Arville. Reach us by phone at 702-254-2251 or visit our website at vbflv.org. me